Welcome to Radicards TV on Radicards.com. I'm your host, Patrick Greeno, and today I'm hosting Brian Hayes of LinguaSportsCards.com. Hello, Brian. How's it going? Hey, Patrick. Doing well tonight. Awesome, awesome. So in this segment of questions, if you're unfamiliar, it's three questions. We talk about them for five minutes each, and uh, we just talk about common dialogue around sports cards, but a little bit deeper thinking, with a standard deviation of about three to five minutes. And I always forget my timer. Every time. Question number one. In what <laughs> ways do guaranteed hits influence product desirability? Um, that's a real good question. I think it, it sort of works both ways. Um, some people like getting, getting a lot of hits, but when, it's, when you're guaranteed a hit, it, it takes away some of, the, some of the excitement of actually pulling a hit when you know that it's coming. Um, and especially now... The, the definition of hit has sort of evolved over time. It used to be, you know, a hit was, you know, going to be an autograph or game use piece, usually of a star player, mm. a high profile, high profile player. Not always, but generally speaking, you know, when, when autographs and game use cards first started coming out in the late 90s, early 2000s, you tended to get a lot more of that. These days, with hits being more prevalent, yes, you're getting more hits, um, you know, guaranteed m more hits than in you know in previous years. But generally speaking, the the quality level of the players represented on those hits isn't the same. And so it's sort of a double-edged sword, I think. I mean, hits in many ways, you know, they drive the hobbies, especially people like who like box breaks. Um, but at the same time, I would say the the excitement from actually pulling a hit has has gone down. Um, to, to a certain extent. So, um, you know, once again, it's, it's sort of a case-by-case -case basis. What product are you in? What type of collector are you? Um, but I would say, um, generally speaking, you know, most products guarantee hits. That says to me people like getting hits, um, even at the start, the, 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 the general level of the hits isn't maybe as high as it may have been in the past. Yeah, I think about it this way. When I was growing up, there was never I was never buying packs with the assumption I was going to get something. It was just mm -hmm. I liked opening packs. But the the stuff, the inserts that were available were so astronomically inserted, you know, at like one in several hundred or a couple boxes or whatever, but you never knew. It's like random inserts and in packs is what they would say. And so you never knew. And actually that stimulated, I think, more intrigue from me to buy the product knowing it wasn't a guarantee. Because the guaranteed hits thing is a total marketing thing, right? It's to get people to buy the product, you know? But right. then all the filler and stuff just is to, to get the, the hits to the, to the customer. So they have to fill it in with base that, you know, sad to say, is just not as desirable as it once was, you know, in the, the 80s and 90s. And so um, when you are guaranteed something, in today's, like, the, 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 the modern version of the guaranteed hits concept, well, I would say that the significance of the hits may not be at the echelon that they once were when hits weren't guaranteed. Does that make sense? Yeah, because I, I totally, totally agree with you. Have, we have very similar feelings on this, I, I, I believe. I, I liked... Um, you know, back in the day, whenever that was, you know, 90s or, you know, early 2000s, prior to the, you know, the, the modern market, there was that, just that non-guaranteed feeling, just the unknown is part of the excitement. Right. And with that taken away in a lot of cases with, with the guarantees, um, you know, that that intrigue isn't quite at the same level. It's still there because you don't know who you're, who's going to be on the hit. Is it going to be an autograph of jersey? What player? But just the general sense of pull, pulling that hit—that's that's gone. Um, at least, at least that's how you know. I would feel, that's how I feel about it. Yeah, it's it's weird. I'll I'll pull a jersey card, and I won't have near the excitement that I had when I would pull like a, just a base insert from the early '90s because the base insert actually featured a player that is either already poised to be a Hall of Famer or is touted to be a potential star, but the cards themselves were beautiful, and 
I always appreciated that by design. I didn't need a chunk of jersey or whatever. That's just my own bias, like the way I collect. So um, the guaranteed hits lends itself to getting, at least in today's market, you know, something that's like, okay, great, I got an autograph for a player I don't, I don't, I've never heard of, or I got a jersey of a player that's okay, but he's not a superstar. Um, but then there's those times where you do get these monster, like, amazing cards. And, and you know, I think that it's still exciting to get something regardless of what it is. I just think that desirability is a bit, it can be influenced or impacted when you're guaranteed something. Um, and so how that looks, I think it gives base cards less credibility, unfortunately. Yeah, just uh, very briefly, uh, yeah. it used to be, I think, people were excited about playing you know, a hit from a box, whatever that might be. But now it seems people, generally speaking, it's like the case hit is what really excites people. Like It's, it's not enough just to get a, a so-called hit. It's got to be whatever that case hit is. And so people just pulling hits out of some, some box... Um, there's there's some excitement there, but it's really because of the oversaturation of hits. It's like, oh, this isn't really until it gets to, to the level of a case hit. Mm -hmm. It's you know that's I think the level that it really takes to get excitement in, in a lot of cases. It's just, it's just different than how it used to be. Sure, and you know case hits are generally considered pretty um, desirable cards, no matter what they are. I, I'm always attracted to that. Like, oh my gosh, this is a case hit, an entire case. This is the one. So. Is it getting now that like the 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 insertion frequency needs to be larger to have more desirability in a product? Instead of boxes, it's now cases. What's well, gonna mm -hmm. be one? This is the palette hit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so good stuff to think about, man. Um, question two: At what point does the number of parallels a card has become too many? Um. Well, I think this this is another this is a good question. It's another long-standing debate that yeah. that that people have. Um, just a number off the top of my head. I'm pulling something here. I would say like four or five. After four or five, it gets to be it gets to be more of a chore to to track down the parallels. Um, it, you know, it's it's pretty cool to have four or five. That's an attainable goal. It's highly collectible. It's 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 difficult in a lot of cases to get four or five parallels based on the especially depending on the serial number of those parallels. Right. After four or five, it gets it gets to be pretty tough. Um, I'm sure player collectors, depending on um, what an individual player collector's goals are, you know, if, if you've got a high number of tiers of parallels for a given card, for those individual collectors, there might be a market for a higher number of parallels. But I would say the average collector, after four or five, it, it starts to, to, to burn out a lot of collectors. Um, I like parallels. Um, I think it does add intrigue, um, but four or five is, is probably the point where I start to once again just feel a little bit burned out. Yeah, I can I can vouch for that. I can I can support that 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 opinion that stance because you know I love the manufacturers. I love Panini. I love Tops. Love Overdeck. I love all these companies. I did Don Russ in 2014, 2015, 2016. This year kind of got out of hand because each card is done in color and then done in black and white. And they're they have the same parallels, most of the same parallels anyway. And mm -hmm. uh, it it's I I kind of just lost interest after like fourteen different parallels, you know. And I still had like six to go, and I hadn't even done the plates. And I'm like, that's it's just it was a lot. Um, I I still love Don Russ, and I hope to continue to do that as a tradition. But um, I think that after like you said four or five, it becomes almost like work. And it's not as yeah. fun anymore. It's not as enjoyable anymore, you know. And but that's just my own opinion. I don't. I, again, I don't know what that that average, you know, general threshold is with too many inserts, too many parallels, rather, um, for for a certain card. I know Bowman Chrome likes to go and be very um, am, ambitious with the regular sized and the minis, and then there's the yep. various paper and the Chrome versions. That can be a quite a pursuit, um, and so. You know, this is this is kind of an interesting conversation because uh, I don't know what the number is. You know, I know that yeah. moments and milestones that Tops did in 20, 2007, 2008 was overkill, like complete overkill. Uh, yeah, I know that Tops Tech from nineteen ninety eight was just insane. You know, ninety nine I got a little bit less, two thousand a little bit less. You know, and so um, 
these mega parallel sets are are it, it turns collecting into almost like a job you know <laughs> like you're being not you're not being paid to do it but becomes it comes like a like knowing that you may not ever get everything you right. know it, it takes the completest mindset and makes it antiquated and i think that in that capacity it makes collecting maybe somewhat less fun but if you're into it to really like if time and money aren't issues i guess is the the, the thing here then you know collecting a whole bunch of parallels might be a good use of time i i don't know what that looks like yeah i i know for me um like i i'm i'm not one to really go after a lot of parallels or anything like that so usually usually what i do as a general rule i'll i'll look at the parallels that are like serial serial numbered like 100 or less or 200 or less depending on the set mm. go after those cards um but and there's usually i mean under that that number there's usually only you know, four or five parallels at most anyway. Mm -hmm. And there's like a lot of those larger serial numbered parallels that, um, you know, just don't interest, the, interest me as much for the reasons that you're discussing discussing right now. But generally speaking, I do like parallels. I'm glad that they're there because I love base cards. I really do. And they, because I just feel like those are the cards where I, I learn the most about players. I still go to baseball cards to actually learn about players. And you get... In the parallels, you get all the great stuff from a base card, and then if you've got a rare enough parallel, it also has that monetary value, which you know, quite frankly, I like. You know, I want I want some of that in my mm -hmm. collection, and so those parallels, generally speaking, I'm glad that they're there. I'm glad that there are maybe more than just one or two for a set. Um, so you know, once again, it's it's finding that balance for me. It's four or five for other collectors. It might be a different number. Sure. Yeah. There's no wrong answer, right? It's just like you know based on you and I, in our conversations, in our circles, you know, um, how many is too many? And, and that's, I don't think there is an answer that's that's going to be generalized across the board. Uh, but these are just interesting things to think about, um, especially in a sort of a parallel craze market that, that exists in today's, in today's atmosphere. So good stuff. Question three. Should a company focus more on improving its weaknesses or should focus be placed exclusively on further building upon its strengths? Um, I would say, and I think the companies would say, it's probably a little bit of both. Um, I'm sure, although, you know, I, I can't say with 100% certainty, but, you know, companies hear what the, collect the collecting community have to say. And, you know, if there's complaints there, the companies have to react to that. They have to, to adapt to, to those weaknesses, whether that's changing brands or, you know, a big complaint usually is the time, the amount of time it takes for redemptions to, uh, to get redeemed. Um, so as far as just customer service, the, the optics of the situation, I think it serves companies well to, to, to note the weaknesses and to try to improve on those. The other end, you know, I would say it's more about, how innovative a company is, which is take, taking their strengths, maintaining that, or trying to, you know, improve on, to improve on on their strengths. Um, but all this said, I think now with, you know, how for the most part each sport only has one major company, full, fully licensed company, fully licensed company. Um, you know, I, I wonder how that's impacted the decisions within the companies as to where they're going to focus their time, their research, and their their, uh, their their money on, which in, proving weaknesses or trying to really build on, on their strengths. So this is a this is totally an MBA question, right? Like business question. It's, um, yeah, I talk about this in my book that, that if we have a core competency, you know, we, we are already good at that. Already, by, by just, just being, we're already, we already are exceptionally proficient at whatever that craft is specifically. So if we, we can take that craft and make it even better, or we can do something which, you know, might not be the best use of our time, which is going from something that we're, where we're just bad at it. Like, we're just not good at it. Like, for example, I can play guitar. Like, put a song in front of me and I can listen to it and then I can figure out how it's played and play it on my guitar. Fine. Put me on the drums, and I'm not a drummer. I know that I'm not a drummer. I just, I, it's not something I desire to be. I'm always just going to be a guitar player. So you put me on the drums. I might be a little bit better than bad at some point, but I'll never be great. I'll, I'll probably never even be good 
I'll just be mediocre. So, you know, um, putting our resources toward going from bad to mediocre instead of going from good to great might not be the best use of our resources, right? Granted, we can fix hiccups along the way, like, you know, um, redemptions being late and customer service times being delivered at a certain time or whatever. But when it comes to delivering a product and understanding, A, that we can dominate that product because we have a really great model, we're already good at it, we can make it great, or are we going to see our product and be like, well, this has been done about a bazillion times, why would we jump into an already saturated market and produce something that is already... That, that, that accommodates a need that, that the need in fact is already being accommodated elsewhere in the market right so yeah you see this a lot with with entrepreneurs young entrepreneurs they'll sometimes jump in to a market that's already saturated and they're not accommodating and accommodating a new need and so they're actually just spinning their wheels trying to figure out how this works when in fact in project management we'll talk about you know plan 80 percent and then implement 20%. That way your implementation will be smoother because you're not working out kinks as you're implementing. All that stuff was planned ahead of time. So, so in this you, case with manufacturers and, and you know um, companies, branching out and diversifying might actually not be the best use of resources. In fact, that those resources should be put in, just invested right back into the, the, the core of what they're already doing, right? To make it so even better. Because they've built brand equity on whatever that is. And you, to okay. have that brand equity and not diminish the alignment between the brand identity and the brand image, the best thing we can do is to continue doing what we're already doing well to make it even better. This is kind of the way I think about business when I see okay. hiccups. Okay, quick question then. Sure. Do you, do you think it's good then for Tops, for example? Tops doesn't have to worry about basketball cards now, hockey cards, football cards, not really. Um, at least no phys physical football card. They still have other things other than baseball, like UFC and a lot of non-sports stuff. Sure. But is it good for Tops that they can focus probably a lot, they have, can have a lot more energy on baseball? Is that good for the company? And is it good for collectors that, you know, Tops is really the only fully licensed baseball product? Now, Panini is producing a lot of good stuff. Mm -hmm. But still, as far as Tops goes... You know, it, it doesn't have to worry about the other sports to the, to the same extent as it used to do. Is that, is that good for Tops? Well, so this is another conversation. What we're talking about here is a, a, a product monopoly, category monopoly. Now, when you have a monopoly in a category, and I love Tops. I've always loved Tops and I'll forever love Tops. But they are a monopoly in a way because they own, they own licensing. And, and the contract says that, you know, we own licensing to this year. This, and it might be auto-renewed. I mean, who knows when we'll see another card manufacturer that will also have licensing to showcase um, uh, uh, team names and logos. You know, we, right. I don't know when we're going to see that. When that happens, oftentimes what you'll see is complacency, stagnation, and a lack of innovation because they don't have competitors. So when a company owns a category with a monopoly, that's what a monopoly is, and they own a category, they have no reason to innovate further because there aren't any competitors. Now, Topps has been innovative a lot in their career, and I've really enjoyed watching them progress in the 30 years of my hobby experience. Um, but the question then becomes, is it bad for collectors to just have one company that has the licensing? I don't have a clear answer to that, actually. All I know is that customer choice is of paramount, paramount significance to uh, to, to business, allowing the customers to have a choice um, between different products from different companies that have similar foci, if you will. The customer choice is important, I think. I've always felt that. You know, that dates back to the research that, that you might do on uh, Coca-Cola products in the early 80s when they produced new Coke and the people just wanted the old Coke and they couldn't have it. So this is a big uproar, like, let's give us back the old Coke. And it was a big problem. So they brought back Coke and they called it Coca-Cola Classic. Okay? Right. So yeah. you can't remove something from a customer to upgrade it without keeping the old available because you already have a market that's loyal to the old product. Back in the 90s, it was there were so many companies that had the licensing and there were a lot of options. And all the companies were trying to outdo each other. And so what you had as a result was a lot of really interesting new technologies to try to out-showcase everybody else. 
I think in a lot of ways, that's why inserts from the 90s are so much cooler looking than they are in today's market. Totally, totally agree. Saying? Totally yeah. agree, right? So I, I totally agree. And um, <clears throat> only... I, I agree, first of all, that, that Tops does a great job with new stuff. I, I like their new stuff. I, I purchased their new stuff. But because they are the only... Current, they're currently the only um, fully licensed uh, manufacturer, manufacturer of baseball. Because of that, I miss the other brands. And so I would say even right now in the year 2017, I'm spending my money on the on non-tops products just as much now as I did 15 years ago. The difference is Upper Deck is not, you know, the direct recipient of my money. All these cards, you know, are now are now in the market. But I'm buying Upper Deck stuff from the 90s, early 2000s, not just because those are great products. They are, but I, I mean, I'm just missing. I like variety in, in companies, um, and. You know, if I can't get that in 2017 products, I just I go search for it elsewhere. And if another manufacturer were to get a full a full license again in baseball, I would probably buy more 2000, you know, 2017 or 18, whatever, whenever, whatever year that would be when they came back. I would buy more modern stuff and probably less less of the cards from different eras. But because I don't have that option now, that that draws me away from 2017 products, modern products. Because I like that variety. Right. Good stuff, man. It's a good conversation. I know we went a little bit over for that number three, but I think it was something interesting to talk about. And it's definitely a lot of good dialogue in there. Thank you, Brian Hayes, for sitting down with us for this episode of Questions. Thank you for watching another episode of Radicards TV on Radicards.com. I'm your host, Patrick Greeno. Thank you, Brian Hayes of Lingua Sports Cards, for joining us today. And sure. until next time, enjoy collecting. If you like this video, please subscribe. Enjoy collecting. Thank you.